The first seeds of doubt about my wife Julia's fidelity were sown following my son Matt's 13th birthday. That day, after leaving work, I stopped by the drugstore to pick up the photographs we had taken during the celebration. Julia was not yet home, so I took the opportunity to sit down and look through the pictures, reminiscing about what a splendid day it had been. Matt had been utterly surprised and delighted by the surprise party we had organised, complete with all his friends eagerly waiting to surprise him. As I sifted through the photos, I stumbled upon a particularly striking picture. It was a close-up of Matt and my lifelong best friend, Steve. Our families were so close that my children affectionately called him Uncle Steve and his kids referred to me as Uncle John. In this photo, I couldn't help but notice startling similarities between Matt and Steve. They shared the same jet black hair, the same shade of green eyes, and even the same distinctively narrow nose. Their skin tones and overall facial features bore such a resemblance that, had I not known better, I would have been convinced they were father and son. Distracted by this unsettling observation, I continued to browse through the other photos, which mostly captured various moments of the children enjoying the party. However, my attention was abruptly drawn to something in the background of one of the pictures. There, almost hidden but unmistakably present, were Julia and Steve in what appeared to be a very intimate embrace. The angle and the moment captured suggested that they were either about to kiss or had just finished kissing. Feeling a surge of discomfort, I meticulously examined the remaining photos for any other instances of Julia and Steve together, but found nothing further. I carefully extracted the two incriminating photos from the stack and concealed them in a drawer in my home office. The resemblance between Matt and Steve, coupled with the image of Julia and Steve in a seemingly intimate moment, was not conclusive evidence of infidelity, but it was enough to ignite a flame of suspicion in my mind. As I was grappling with these troubling thoughts, Julia arrived home, adhering to her usual routine. She walked through the front door, greeted me with a kiss, and proceeded upstairs to change out of her work attire, a pattern so familiar and unremarkable until that moment. With suspicion now clouding my thoughts, I followed her upstairs, driven by a newfound urgency to uncover the truth. Upon entering the bedroom, I noticed Julia's surprise at my sudden appearance, but she exhibited no signs of guilt or discomfort. Hey, honey, how was your day? Julia inquired casually as she changed into her more comfortable house clothes. Not too bad, I replied, trying to maintain a semblance of normalcy. I picked up the pictures from Matt's party. They turned out great, but don't you think we went a little overboard? Five reels of film for a birthday party seems a bit much, doesn't it? My words were tinged with a subtle probing tone, a stark contrast to the innocent, celebratory nature of the event we had so painstakingly planned to surprise our son. In response to my query about the excessive number of photos taken at Matt's birthday party, Julia nonchalantly remarked that she wanted to ensure we had ample memories of the day, mentioning how wonderful it was to have invited all of his friends and family, including Steve, Mary, and their kids. I keenly observed her reaction when I mentioned Steve's name. There was a slight movement, a potential flinch, but it was ambiguous. Could it have been a natural gesture or a reaction to Steve's name being mentioned? Yeah, it was a great party, Julia replied, but other than that possible flinch, I couldn't discern anything more from her behaviour. I decided to be more vigilant about Julia and Steve, watching for any signs of impropriety. I didn't resort to extreme measures like high-tech tracking, audio recording, video cameras, or phone tapping, at least not immediately. Instead, I began a simpler form of tracking. Whenever Julia mentioned her plans, I would find reasons to call and verify her whereabouts. A few weeks later, the tragic discovery of a missing little girl's body in a lake presented an unexpected opportunity. The girl's family had previously done DNA testing, facilitating her identification under the grim circumstances. Julia, seemingly perturbed by the news, suggested we do the same for our children. If something ever happens and a body or body part is found, I'd want to know if it's our child, she proposed. Agreeing with her, 
I remarked on the practicality of the idea, especially considering the state of the little girl's remains which had made traditional identification methods difficult. I volunteered to take our four children, Matt, Ashley, Hannah and Sarah for DNA testing and to file the results with the county. At the family doctor's office, Dr. Smith inquired about the reason for the tests. I explained my desire for personal copies of the DNA results, citing a lack of trust in the county's record keeping and a preference to keep such crucial information in our home safe. Dr. Smith understood, noting that many parents request copies for similar reasons. Two weeks later, when I had to go out of town for a business trip, I took the opportunity to conduct a personal investigation. With the DNA tests in hand, I visited a doctor's office to validate a personal matter. A woman I had lived with for eight years claimed that I was the father of her four children. This visit was a crucial step in unravelling the tangled web of personal and familial doubts that had been haunting me. The complexity of my personal situation escalated when a woman I had lived with for eight years began demanding child support, claiming I was the father of her four children. Doubting the paternity of one or more of these children, I had obtained DNA records and approached a doctor for clarification. I needed to understand the extent of my financial responsibilities towards these children. In the doctor's office, I explained my predicament. I have reason to believe I might not be the father of some of these children, I told the doctor. She empathised, noting how such situations can destroy marriages. Clarifying that I was no longer with this woman and was currently married to someone else, I expressed my frustration about the alimony demands. I had received the envelope containing the DNA results, but hadn't mustered the courage to open it. The uncertainty weighed heavily on me, especially as I neared home. When I arrived on Friday night, I found the house empty, with a note from my wife Julia saying she had taken the kids to her mother's for the weekend. Alone and anxious, I decided to confront the truth. After calming my nerves with a glass of scotch, I opened the envelope. The results were shocking. None of the four children were biologically mine, yet it was evident they shared the same father. Distraught, I consumed another drink and eventually fell asleep, only to wake up at four in the morning, tormented by thoughts of what to do next. Suspecting Steve to be the father of the children, I resolved to gather concrete evidence. On Saturday morning, I purchased an extensive array of surveillance equipment from a nearby store. I meticulously installed motion-activated cameras, sound recorders and tracking devices in Julia's car and Steve's SUV. This setup allowed me to monitor their movements and interactions remotely. I even managed to install a tracking device on Steve's SUV when he visited that Saturday, under the pretense that Julia was out of town. With this in place, I was certain I could track their whereabouts. In my quest for more evidence, I rummaged through Julia's belongings on Sunday morning. Aside from finding unfamiliar sexy lingerie, there was no definitive proof of her infidelity. When Julia returned home with the kids that evening, I maintained a semblance of normalcy, greeting them warmly. However, that night, Julia dropped a bombshell. She believed she was pregnant. I was stunned. Given our history of struggling with fertility and the effort it took to conceive our first four children, her news was overwhelming. In response, I decided to schedule a fertility test for myself to further understand this perplexing situation. My wife Julia's unexpected pregnancy raised my suspicions further. It seemed implausible given our previous struggles with fertility. Determined to seek clarity, I discreetly visited a clinic in a neighbouring town for a fertility test. The results were revealing. My sperm count was above average. This stark contrast to our past fertility issues only fueled my suspicions that Steve, not I, had fathered Julia's children. Driven by a need for concrete evidence, I meticulously monitored the data from the surveillance equipment I had installed. The tracking devices revealed a pattern. Steve would leave for work and then head to a hotel on the east side of town. Julia's movements mirrored his. After a stop at the doctor's office, she too would arrive at the same hotel. This damning evidence was hard to ignore. 
Julia, oblivious to my internal turmoil, expressed her joy about the pregnancy, believing we were blessed with another child. Holding back my emotions and the information I had gathered was increasingly challenging. Over the next few weeks, I continued my surveillance, uncovering a consistent pattern in their rendezvous. Steve and Julia met regularly for long lunches at the hotel on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays, always booking the same room. I captured photographs of them entering and exiting the hotel, which was all the evidence I needed. There was no necessity to know what transpired inside. Even more distressingly, on Tuesdays and Thursdays, they used our guest bedroom for their encounters. The continual betrayal playing out in my own home was agonizing. The final straw came when I recorded a phone conversation between Julia and Steve. In it, Steve expressed concern about my possible suspicions, but Julia dismissed them confidently, claiming I was oblivious to their affair. Steve commented on how Matt, our son, was increasingly resembling him, to which Julia coldly remarked that for 15 years she had ensured that all her children were fathered by Steve, not me. Their conversation was a chilling confirmation of my worst fears. Shaken by this revelation, I decided to initiate divorce proceedings on grounds of marital infidelity. Armed with substantial evidence, including photographs and recorded conversations, I met with an attorney, Dave, to discuss my case. Dave cautioned that proving marital infidelity could be challenging in our state. However, I was resolute, presenting the evidence of the affair including the photographs capturing the sexual encounters between Julia and Steve. This evidence was crucial in building a strong case for divorce based on adultery. In pursuit of concrete evidence against my wife Julia's infidelity, I had gathered a substantial amount of proof. Armed with video footage, recorded phone conversations that detailed their affair, and DNA tests proving that none of the four children I had been raising were biologically mine, I was ready to confront the situation head on. I presented this evidence to my attorney, Dave, asking if it was sufficient for a divorce case. Yes, that should be more than enough, Dave affirmed, agreeing to send Julia the divorce papers immediately. Seizing the opportunity, I proposed a specific time and place for serving the papers during one of her trysts with her lover, Steve, at our house. Dave acknowledged that this plan, while dramatic, was legally acceptable. Eager to expose the affair publicly, I devised a plan under the guise of a surprise party to celebrate Julia's new pregnancy. I carefully invited her family, friends, and Steve's wife, Mary, ensuring she was the last to know to prevent any forewarning to Steve. I even suggested that Julia's and Steve's employers be present, adding another layer to the revelation. The plan was set in motion on the agreed day. I asked everyone to gather quietly in our yard, under the pretext that Julia was resting inside. Dave was also present, divorce papers in hand. As the clock neared the appointed time, we stealthily entered the house and made our way to the guest bedroom. With a coordinated effort, we burst into the room, our collective shout of surprise echoing through the space. The scene that unfolded was one of utter shock and confusion. Mary, Steve's wife, immediately confronted him in anger. Julia's family turned their outrage towards her while she frantically attempted to defend herself. Steve, caught in the act, scrambled to collect his clothes but found his escape blocked by his boss, who was visibly disappointed. In the midst of this chaotic scene, Dave approached Julia with a composed demeanour. She sat on the bed, wrapped in a sheet, her sobs piercing the tense air. Dave calmly handed her the divorce papers, officially marking the dissolution of our marriage. The public exposure of Julia and Steve's affair was a dramatic culmination of my search for truth and the beginning of a new, albeit uncertain, chapter in my life. In the midst of the tumultuous revelation of Julia's infidelity, my attorney Dave delivered the divorce terms to her in a clear, emotionless tone, reminiscent of a robot's impassivity. He stated that I was filing for divorce on grounds of adultery and that I was not seeking custody of the four children we had raised together, nor the unborn child.
This decision was based on DNA evidence proving I was not their biological father and a recorded conversation where Julia admitted to intentionally ensuring the children were fathered by her lover, Steve, and not me. Dave announced that I was claiming a significant portion of our estate, 90%, and a court date would be scheduled unless Julia accepted these terms. With the delivery of these papers, Dave promptly left the scene. In the aftermath of this exposure, both Julia and Steve faced severe consequences. They lost their jobs and Steve's marriage with Mary ended in divorce. Julia's family, who had always been fond of me, disowned her due to her actions. In the divorce settlement, while I initially claimed 90%, I eventually agreed to a slightly lower figure, 75.5%. Additionally, I pursued a separate legal case against Steve, receiving compensation for his role in preventing me from fathering children. Despite the deep love I once held for Julia, the extent of her betrayal made it somewhat easier for me to detach myself from her. I occasionally see her around town, and each encounter is marked by her attempts to apologise, which I invariably dismiss. The depth of her deceit, her years-long affair, deliberately deceiving me into believing I was the father of her children with Steve, had irrevocably damaged our relationship. The children, who I had raised as my own, were understandably confused and distressed upon learning the truth about their paternity. Discovering that Uncle Steve was in fact their biological father and their supposed cousins were actually half-siblings was a hard reality for them to grapple with. They underwent extensive counselling to deal with the ramifications of Julia's actions. While I harboured no ill will towards the children and still cared for them, the situation was a stark reminder of Julia's ultimate betrayal. She had chosen to have Steve's children over mine, a decision that now left her facing the consequences as the children struggled with feelings of resentment and betrayal towards her. Despite everything, they continued to affectionately call me daddy whenever our paths crossed, a bittersweet reminder of the complex bond we shared. 